about nutrition support it is a it is of particular importance especially for patients with or at risk of malnutrition when we are not able to achieve patients targets with oral diet or with top up supplement then we think of you know enteral feeding the first line of choice is oral supplementation it is a protein powder which can be sprinkled over the food uh, or uh, this is a very important thing that i want to discuss because fortification in the food is very important especially in sicker cases say for example like in quote an example of ecmo patients wherein you know meeting their higher protein requirement without tube feeding was a challenge because they used to have a restricted carbohydrate intake and a higher protein intake as prescribed so we normally we supplement protein we these protein powders are mixed with food and we can make uh, you know either chapatis or adai dosa all those can be made it can be sprinkled it can be cooked and given next comes your oral sip feeds which can be mixed with water and a short dose of 50 to 70 ml can be given intermittently after the meal and egg whites and soups is a way of improvising your uh, protein blenderized chicken soup etc next comes your oral supplemental powder there are a lot of varieties available though it is all in powdered form but globally when you look at uh, it's all in 100 ml small sachets in liquid form just sip it and throw it off here it is like uh, you know we advise few scoops at least thrice or four times a day so that we are able to achieve their calorie and protein requirement it's either polymeric oligomeric disease specific or isolated macronutrients say for example in uh, patients uh, with uh, steatorrhea mct oil based diet can be given because it is better absorbed so we do get separate entity as mct based uh, diet and uh, disease specific formulas are available diabetic friendly renal friendly hepatic friendly formulas and uh, i would like to quote uh, our study here wherein uh, it, it was not a very easy thing to implement oral supplementation across the hospital for malnourished patients it took us about a year's time because we had to literally train all the doctors nurses and dietitians it was done in three phase and uh, you know we did find that uh, there was a decrease of allos in 18% compared to the existing ons protocol what we had prior and we did find that only 2% of the malnourished patients had ons in our existing practice so what we did was we did a baseline understanding of the uh, patients uh, you know 500 patients then next step we sensitized all the dietitians and ensured that we gave guidelines for them to prescribe ons and the third phase we sensitized the nutrition support team that is the doctors nurses and the dietitians together so it was uh, for all malnourished patients where whose sga score was between 15 to 35 and we did find that in phase 3 when the nst was strong we could find a gradual decrease in their length of stay and there was a, a significant improvement in the ons prescription also which was about less than 10% in the phase 1 which increased to 45% and we did find readmission rates were less uh, significantly lower in uh, ons group which was 26% compared to 72% in non ons group this was the uh, decreased uh, allos in uh, patients who were initiated on ons as early as 6 hours of prescription so one out of three indians that is our hospital patients were malnourished on admission and we did find a 2.5 day decrease in uh, uh, the length of stay which really adds on uh, to their uh, cost and this was a hospital malnutrition pathway that we had uh, brought out 
which was published in clinical nutrition at ACE Penn, where, wherein we could give them some triggers for the early initiation of ONS on uh, admission. If the patient was, uh, you know, malnourished with a BMI of less than 18.5, baseline weight loss, insignificant oral intake during admission, um, loss of muscle and fat mass, and generalized uh, fluid accumulation, especially ascites and edema, all these were triggers for ONS initiation at the earliest. And uh, next, uh, this publication, this is like customizing a nutrition intervention for uh, liver transplant patients, uh, wherein we did look at uh, their dietary uh, habits, uh, their uh, requirement. Uh, according to their dietary habit, we had, uh, you know, customized the uh, nutrition supplement for them. Uh, say, for example, lacto-vegetarians, over-lacto-vegetarians and obese patients were given very high protein, high calorie supplement compared to non-vegetarians uh, who were given uh, high calorie, high protein supplement. In our historic group, uh, you do find we had not changed the supplement for any of them. All of them got high protein, high calorie supplement only. And according to their intake, if their intake was less than 75% of the requirement, uh, we gave oral supplementation. If the intake was less than 50% nocturnal tube feed, and if their intake was less than 25%, it was continuous tube feed, which was prescribed. And uh, with customized uh, intervention, we were able to achieve more than 75% of the target uh, in uh, the second group or the intervened group. Uh, here you do find, uh, you know, increased uh, number of uh, patients achieving more than 75% of their nutritional target, both calorie and protein. So when compared to the standard prescription and individualized uh, protocol to diagnose, stratify the severity of uh, malnutrition at the earliest and follow up by uh, customized intervention for patients helped us achieve nutritional targets more effectively. In spite of patients' diversity in habits, especially in nutritional habits, and reluctance to accept change, it is clear that a qualified and dedicated transplant nutrition team can successfully implement perioperative nutrition protocol to achieve better nutritional targets. And uh, my latter results showed that uh, you know, 80% of the target of people could achieve, they had a better, uh, you know, um, morbidity and mortality compared to those who could not achieve 80% of the 